he spoke um, quite recently at the UN and said, you know, this is um, the issue of our time. Here's just a recent chart that I, you know, just came out from NOAA showing the most recent data, essentially what he can do under the Clean Air Act. And that actually requires um, all of the states of the United States to come up separately with their own uh, plan for how each state is going to comply um, with these um, goals. Uh, President Obama is saying this is the challenge of our time, and then on the other hand, pursuing a trade policy that is in utter conflict. And then some of the ways that um, these policies um, or trade agreements um, undermine what we're trying to do here. And then a little bit at the end about what's happening in Congress. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's all those countries in red. Uh, this is an agreement that's been under negotiation for, I think we're into the fifth year now. After it's fully negotiated, signed on the deadline, if it gets approved by Congress, additional countries can come into that agreement and join in with it. But even with the current membership, it's 40% of the global GDP, so it's really huge. There's 29 chapters, and many of them have nothing to do with tariffs. Most of them have nothing to do with tariffs. Instead, they have to do with something called regulatory barriers, uh, non-tariff barriers to trade. And uh, as we get into this discussion, it's really about deregulation. Um, the other agreement has being, that's being negotiated is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment um, Partnership, or TTIP for short. Um, but that's um, the European Union, and you know that's 28 countries uh, in the EU. So the thing about these agreements is they're negotiated in secret. And um, even though like the Trans-Pacific Partnership's been going on for over four years, not one um, line of uh, text from the U.S. side has been made public, even though um, chapters have been closed and agreed to already. Um, so there's no way to go in and, and see what's going on. And um, it, with the Trans-Atlantic, uh, partnership with the EU, it's been a little different situation because a lot of things have leaked. Um, what we s have to say right now about these agreements is going to be based on leaks. It's going to be based on some of the public statements that have been made, and it's also based on what, what is already in other trade agreements, which they've said publicly they're going to build on those other trade agreements and put them into these ones. So we have a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that are in it. We just don't know the wording. Um, so this is just an example. There's over 600 advisors to the U.S. Trade Representative, um, and almost all of them are industry advisors. And this is a, a screenshot of the uh, Energy Committee. And uh, as Alana says when she gives this presentation, uh, the Sierra Club is not on this list. Obviously, this is Chevron and the nuclear industry and the gas industry and everything, you know. Um, so how um, do these trade agreements go after renewable energy? If, you know, even if we just go to the kind of limited Obama plan, um, if it's going to work, uh, all the U.S. states are going to have to do a lot of these things, if not all of them, and other things as well. So these are all different things that um, we're doing right now in um, the United States and certainly in other countries as well. So unfortunately, though, um, there's some really significant um, threats to all of those policies uh, in these trade agreements. Um, one of them has to do with buy local. Buy local and buy American rules are all about using our, our own tax dollars and saying, where do we want them to go? Well, it's it's also like a way of providing um, opportunities to really you know, beef up the economy at the same time that you're doing something good for the environment here. Um, there are many, many um, trade cases that have challenged um, subsidies for uh, renewable energy program. And this is just uh, a slide that I got from Matt Porterfield at um, Georgetown Law School um, under the World Trade Organization. These are existing agreements, okay? So this isn't the new ones. This is under existing law. You know, you um, can't do that. Uh, the, the Chinese have, uh, they haven't actually filed a case, but they've um, issued a report that you can find on their website that says that these states, California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, and Washington State, 
are violating the WTO rules right now because they're providing these unlawful subsidies. Canada has said that renewable portfolio standards that don't provide for energy from Hydro-Quebec, but they have asserted that all these state renewable uh, portfolio standards um, violate the WTO or NAFTA. Um, this is a map that just shows um, rebate programs in 2013 um, to encourage people to um, install. And then here's re renewable portfolio standards. They're not all as good as, as they could be, but look how many states are already doing that. And if we're going to meet the, the challenge of climate change, um, this is one way of doing it. And so if Canada's saying that violates trade rules, it's kind of taking a lot of the tools out of the toolbox that you might have. Uh, but they, they have found that TTIP is absolutely going to increase um, uh, you know, CO2 emissions. So the other thing that trade agreements do is that they promote the export of fossil fuels. What's going on now is that um, we've had a long-standing policy that you don't export uh, oil and gas without uh, having a review by the Department of Energy. And so having the Department of Energy do a study and determine that it's not a good idea to be um, exporting more oil and gas would be a barrier to trade. Automatic exports of natural gas are extremely dangerous from a climate perspective. It means that there's going to be more fracking in the United States. Um, in order to produce enough foreign gas for export, the United States would have to produce significantly more gas, most of which would come from fracking. The process of liquefying it uh, uh, is very energy intensive. Uh, the last area where um, these trade agreements are really, uh, you know, in total conflict with um, addressing climate policy is the whole area of corporate rights. Um, and specifically something called the Investor State Dispute uh, Settlement uh, actually um, pretty much elevates corporations to being um, like country. A company can go after a country and um, essentially sue them for having a policy that they don't like and generally because it reduces the profits that they wanted to get. I mean, that's basically what they're talking about. When they do challenge uh, regulations, it's in these arbitration tribunals. It's not the court system. They could go to court, but um, they would probably lose their case in court because um, the standards that they're going under under these trade agreements are really loosey-goosey compared to uh, what's in the U.S. Constitution. They have, their career path is well established. The cases, look at this. This, these is, the number of these cases in 1987 was like a blip, and every year it's gone up exponentially. So there's a dramatically um, large increase of these cases. Now there's uh, more than 50 a year in each of the last three years. And you see over on the right-hand side some of these cases. Um, so so they're, they're lawyers, and they're lawyers that have potentially very serious conflicts of interest. I mean, it's appalling, really, because it, it really sidesteps um, the standards of the Constitution and the, the whole court system that we have set up. And um, you know, just to give you an example of these cases, um, the one there, it says um, nuclear energy, vault and fall. Well, you probably remember Fukushima, where there was this horrible accident. It's still you know, leaking today. And I don't know how many years ago that was with the tsunami. So after that, um, Germany decided um, to close down its nuclear power plants. And it is on the path to do that and replace, to have no nuclear power at all. So Valtenfall is a Swedish company that was running some of those plants, probably wanted to build other ones. So they are bringing a lawsuit against Germany right now saying that you don't have the right to um, close down nuclear power plants because it violates free trade rules. This is a case that has been filed um, by a company called Lone Pine Resources. They're suing under NAFTA because the Quebec Parliament acted in an arbitrary, capricious, and illegal manner. Um, now, the interesting thing here is, because I, I actually met with some Ke uh, Quebecers to learn more about this, they do not, did not have a permit to, to frack, uh, you know, a specific permit to, to frack. They did not have one. 
Um, but they're acting as if they did. You know, they're right because they were planning to do it and had maybe done some exploratory stuff. It was as if they already had a permit that was now being taken away from them, and, and that's the kind of claim they're making. The other thing that they said, if you, if you read this, it says, it was taken away from them by Quebec um, without due process, without compensation, and with no cognizable public purpose. Now, that is ridiculous. I mean, the public purpose here is to protect people and the environment. Uh, and, and I heard all about the process that they went through in the Quebec Parliament where they had, you know, stakeholder meetings and public hearings just like we have here in Maine and everything. So, I mean, essentially this company is saying, you know, we don't like the process that's followed in, in representative government and we're going to sue. Um, and they're suing for quite a bit of $250 million. So this is the kind of case that um, could be filed here. This is the state of um, New York. The, the theory is that these trade agreements produce jobs. Estimates are the Trans-Pacific Partnership will uh, provide $77 billion a year in real income and support 650,000 new jobs in the yep, U.S. It says our advice remains to be wary whenever a politician claims a policy will uh, yield bountiful jobs. I would agree with that. Um, but then he says in this case the correct number is zero jobs. Zero jobs, you know, in the long run will be created. Zero, zero, zero. And that um, there's a lot more jobs associated with renewable energy weatherization, you know, the building retrofits, that's, you know, weatherization, those kinds of things, um, than are actually coming out of coal and oil and natural gas. In summary, um, this is what these two agreements um, are going to be doing, um, encouraging fossil fuel exports, subsidizing uh, fossil fuel development and extractive activities, uh, discouraging renewable energy, undermining our ability to regulate carbon, like fracking, um, and providing additional ways that industry can attack um, reg environmental regulation in exchange for no jobs. So here's what's going on right now. Called, um, it's called Trade Promotion Authority, or Fast Track, and it's to provide for a speeded up um, consideration and review of any trade agreement that comes um, to Congress um, you know, over a period of time. And I don't know what this bill's going to save. It's like 10 years or five years or whatever. But essentially, trade agreements that have not yet even been envisioned would be um, addressed by this procedure. Um, the proposals in the past, and we think that this is the proposal that they're going to be considering, would say that there, it would be a straight up or down vote, no amendments, and limited to 20 hours debate. Keeping in mind, these are agreements that are negotiated in secret. They're hundreds of pages long. Yes, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not a trade a lawyer, and I'm telling you, they are virtually impossible to figure out what they do. So you're asking members of Congress to get this thing plopped on their desk to try to decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's got 29 chapters. Um, so he, this is a timeline. I'm almost done. Um, but right now is when... Um, we're likely to see uh, Fast Track come. There's an intensive lobbying going on right now. Um, if you have the opportunity to, to raise these issues with friends of yours on social media, calling, uh, now is the time to do it. You know, um, go meet with your member of Congress, uh, especially those of you in the second district. Um, that, you know, they need to hear from their constituents that this is not a good thing. You know, and, the, you know, I, I've had some conversations with um, members of Congress, some who might want to vote for the underlying agreement. And I'm like, this is, those are two different decisions. One is what are the rules by which we're going to decide, you know, how to vote on something. The other is, do I want to vote for this agreement or that agreement? They're two separate things. This is a process decision, and it's a really uh, turning into an undemocratic process. Um, we do think that the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, negotiations will conclude this year, so then that would be the first trade agreement, and uh, President Obama really wants it to come to Congress before the next election. They never like these um, trade agreements to be debated close to an election because they're very unpopular.